Hello, New York Giants fans. Welcome back to the Everything New York Giants podcast with New York Giants fangirl. I'm Adriana, your host, and today I am joined by Dan Schneier from Big Blue Banter, who I'm sure you guys all know and love. I'm excited to have him on, especially to talk about some film stuff. So welcome, Dan. It's great to have you back. Great to be back on the show. We had a great time talking ball last time, and it's a more exciting time than ever, I think, at least this season to talk Giants football. I said this to a few of my friends who I've been talking about the Giants with this week, and I was like, this is probably the most excited I've ever been about a two and three team in my lifetime, just because they finally put together, though not on the scoreboard, but a complete mm -hmm. football game last week against the Seattle Seahawks. I haven't seen that from them in so long. Good on offense, good on defense, good on special teams. You just don't get that a lot as a Giants fan. So it does get you a little excited about what's to come. It's still a very long season with a lot of games left on the schedule. Yeah. And I think what's frustrating is, you know, I hear a lot from Giants fans, a lot of the woulda, shoulda, coulda game, especially when it comes to Saquon and McKinney. Now that McKinney is doing so well with the Packers, like all sorts of stuff like that. But I'm more upset about the fact that we didn't beat the commanders in games this year that we were so close that we didn't pull it out. But like you said, it's it's actually kind of confidence inducing that we're not getting blown out every single game. And I think when you look back on the way the season has gone and you look at Minnesota and how well they have done, it feels like that game was more of an outlier than the regular of what this Giants team is going to be for the season. Yeah, I think that's a good fair. thing. Yep. Yeah. So I want to talk about, so for those of you who guys do, who don't know Big Blue Banter, Dan and Nick Filato do a lot of film review, which for someone like me, especially if you're at the games and stuff like that, and someone like me who didn't grow up playing football, um, it's fascinating to really see the replays and see you guys break it down. So obviously a common complaint from Giants fans, especially coming out of this past game without neighbors was, where is Jalen Hyatt? Because he played a lot of the snaps. I mean, even from what I could see on TV, I felt like at least up until the third quarter, it seems like he played 95, if not 100% of those snaps. And, you know, I got a comment saying that Jalen Hyatt is completely useless. What's he doing out there? Give Isaiah Hodgins a playing time and all sorts of stuff. And I had to correct him because at least Jalen Hyatt did draw two DPI calls. So he wasn't entirely useless. But from what you saw on the film, specifically in this game, what's your takeaway about Hyatt? What's What do you think is really going on there? Yeah, so just to base it on what I, we saw this week when he got his first extended opportunity, and like you said, it wasn't 100% of snaps, but it was close, and it was, I think, 44 snaps was the total, which is the most he's gotten by far this year. And so I think the breakdown is two. he, he caused two holding penalties, which is a net positive for any team. So him being on the field on those snaps led to automatic first downs for the Giants. He had uh, two plays, I think, that that I charted, and I think I looked at David Syverson, who's a really good follow as well, who charted this as well, where he got beat in press man coverage. And that's just something that is going to happen right now with Jalen Hyatt, potentially his whole career, if he's used on the outside, which I don't think he always will be. I think there will be times where in the future, the Giants move him around, get him involved in these tight splits like we've seen, which means a bunch of wide receivers, like in a bunch formation around the line of scrimmage, not lined up too far off of the line of scrimmage. If he's isolated as a, an X or a Z, you know, it, there will be times he's going to get press man and he's not going to be able to beat that press man. But what I say the future is because I don't think that we all look at this like Jalen Hyatt was drafted last year. He should be playing. He should be contributing mm -hmm. to this offense. But there's a depth chart and he is fourth on the depth chart for a reason. Wondell Robinson is a vital part of this offense. This offense is 28th in the NFL in throws and, and throws that it go past the sticks. This is not an offense that likes to throw the ball down the field that often they took their shots last week and finally it connected. But the, mm -hmm. the objective of this passing game is the short passing game is the quick passing game is finding solutions within two and a half seconds to avoid sacks, to avoid negative plays. And that's why Wondell Robinson is such an important piece. He can't come off the field, right? Neighbors, that goes without saying. And then Darius Slayton is a player who has proven to be better than Hyatt at this point in his career. But Darius Slayton is a better blocker. Darius Slayton can beat press man coverage better. He's won more down the field more often. He knows the offense better as well, and he can operate different roles within the offense. So there's really just not a lot of opportunity. Last week, he finally got his opportunity, like you said. A couple holding calls. I'll give him a positive for that. Got beat a couple times in press man. But also on one of the long passes, he was open too. Jones went to slate. It worked. I'm happy with it. You're happy with it. We're all happy with it, but it could easily been high. And we all would have been saying this week, like, look at him. He got his opportunity and he was successful. So I want to just, let's say, pause the overreact. I don't want to say overreaction, yeah. but like the nervousness when it comes to Hyatt. we just got to give it time. Like he will develop at his own pace. 
Yeah. And he is so young, like you said, and, you know, he wasn't drafted to be a Malik neighbors like Malik neighbors is getting the bulk of the snaps because that's who he is. That's what his talent level is. And Jalen Hyatt was never that. And he wasn't expected to be that. I think with Giants fans, there's still this narrative that just Darius Slayton is a terrible receiver. And I, I understand the frustrations with the drops and things like that, but you know, a, he's not the only person on this team who drops the ball and B he's made a lot of really nice plays for this team too. And, you know, five out of six years, he's been the leading giants receiver, whether, you know, he wanted to be or not. It's just, he was the best of the best, regardless of who the other talent was on the team. So I think that he is a really good player. And I just think that people see Hyatt and they see he's young and shiny and new and, you know, he can run vertical routes. So he should be doing that instead of Slayton. But out of everything you've seen out of Slayton, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to say that he's the better receiver, right? Yeah, at least right now at this point in their career. And I am with you on that. I take contention a lot with fans about Darius Slayton because I believe he's a much better receiver than the fans uh, believe he is to be. And I think, you know, a lot of the negatives sometimes get out, uh, can outshine the positives in the, mm -hmm. in, in people's minds. Um, I use this example all the time, but last year, Tyreek Hill led the league in drops and he was still the best receiver in the NFL oh, wow. despite it. So it just goes to show it's not a one-to-one -one example. I'm not trying to compare those two players at, at all uh, for obvious reasons, right. but it just goes to show like drops are a little bit overrated in my mind, at least. And I understand mm -hmm. how that sounds stupid because it's like, if we had caught this pass, we convert that fourth down and, and now we're moving the ball and we might score and win. And I agree with that. But also if Darius Slayton doesn't, come over the middle on that third and five, get sandwiched in between two defenders, come down with the catch last week, or run that route for the touchdown or run that route for the 40 yard gain, then that drop pass never comes to be because you're never in the situation to win the game at the end of the game. But with all that said, I think Hyatt eventually will be a complete receiver for the Giants. I don't think he's just somebody who's going to be running vertical clear out routes because last year on tape, he proved he's really good at the catch point. He was high pointing the ball. He was really good at adjusting in the air with his body control and really good around the sideline with toe tapping catches. We saw it all on tape last year. Plus, when given the opportunity, they ran him on a drag route. I believe it was against the Patriots. Um, and, he, and he put his foot in the dirt and made somebody miss. So he shows he can do that as well. And then you think about the Bills game last year that they ended up losing at the end. But mm -hmm. to get them there, they converted a fourth and six where Tyrod ran him over the middle. And again, just like the catch last week with Slayton, Hyatt got sandwiched in between two defenders, came up with the catch. So he showed toughness on that too. So these traits are still all on his tape. It's just the opportunity isn't really there right now. And that's okay. That's just how it goes sometimes. The depth chart, it's a good thing. The depth chart is actually pretty in a pretty good spot at wide receiver right now. Yeah, which is one of – going into the season, I thought that that and running back were going to be the two strongest positions on the team, and, and it seems as if that's proving to be. So knowing that, I think one of the keys to the Giants beating the Bengals is having a successful run game. They, like the Cowboys, do not have a good run defense. Unfortunately for the Giants, they couldn't figure out how to do it well during the Cowboys game. But I think after having some success after – the Seahawks game that I think going into the Bengals, we should see some sort of strong run game. So with that being said, what do you think about the Singletary versus Tracy split? I think that Dable really likes motor. I think we would all agree with that. So I, I'm trying to kind of temper expectations of like, yes, we saw amazing things from, Sing, uh, from Tracy and we all want to see more of him, but like, I wouldn't expect him to get a hundred percent of the snaps now if Singletary's healthy and does end up playing, which he was limited yesterday. So I do think he's going to play. Yeah, it's a really interesting scenario that's evolved for the Giants, obviously rest of season and this week against the Bengals. Um, I said, I would like to see something like a 60, 40, 60, Tracy, 40 Singletary moving forward. But I don't know how realistic that actually is for a multitude of reasons. Yeah. First, obviously, Dable has the liking towards Singletary. But part of that is because he's played within his system before in the past in Buffalo. And then again here and in general, Devin Singletary is pretty good in pass protection. I haven't had the chance yet. I want to go back and chart all of Tracy's pass protection reps from this week. Um, I test wise, just from what I remember, he he held up pretty well there. But there's other aspects to it as far as the mental goes. Like there will be times, for example, where Daniel Jones will make a check pre-snap and get his running back in a different position to pass protector, you know, have him on the same page. And if he picks the right way to go or like if he understands that that check, that's something that's going to matter. And I have to look back at the tape and kind of take a look specifically on that. So that'll play a role. But the reason why I want a 60 40 is not because I believe, and, and I do believe that Tracy could be a special player. I believe that in his pre draft analysis, I said he was the best value pick we made. I couldn't, I think the only reason they got him so late was simply because of his age, which 
I don't know how much that matters. He's an older prospect for sure. He converted from wide receivers in college for a while, but running backs don't play for it until like, you know, we're not looking, you're not drafting a running back to have him play until his late thirties or mid thirties. Anyway. Right. So what you can get out of him is important now, but what he offers the offense is really interesting. There's been a few plays over the last two weeks where one against Dallas, where they lined him up outside, um, they motioned him out, and he ran a vertical route. And I believe the Giants got called for like a illegal man downfield or an illegal shift. But Jones just oh, missed. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, the one right mm-hmm. by the end zone. Jones just yep. missed him. That's a converted wide receiver. If you can get him yeah. on the field. You can go to empty or you can bring him back in. It gives you so much diversity as an offense. It gives you that schematic uncertainty for the opposing side for the defense. Like when he's on the field, he could be lined up and motioned out as a receiver. We need to have personnel on the field that can defend him. So I think he offers you more as an offense because of that, because of his skill set as a wide receiver. And he showed a lot as a running back too. Like it's yeah. kind of crazy to watch his tape from last week because – He's from a vision standpoint, he's at another level. He's finding holes. He's pressing the line of scrimmage to set up linebackers. They're committing to that gap. And then he's bouncing it outside and has the athleticism and the lateral agility to get there and to beat the rest of the D line and that linebacker. So from a skill set standpoint, I think he should play 60% of the time. I mm-hmm. would guess it's going to be closer to like 70 single target, 30 Tracy. Yeah. And then moving. I think probably as the season progresses, we will eventually see more Tracy. Hopefully. Yeah. I, my problem with Dable, and I think it it seems like, I mean, I hopefully he's getting better with this, is, is his stubbornness. And I just hope that that is not part of this, right? It's like, well, I like Motor. He knows the offense, and he's been here for X amount of time, and he's the vet, blah, blah, blah. But you also have to go based on what worked and, you know, going against this Cincinnati team who doesn't have a great run defense and who doesn't really have a great defense at all. It should be a good matchup for a lot of our players on offense, but I'm curious to see what Dable does from the running back perspective. And even Eric Gray, look outside of that fumble, when, when Jones tossed him that screen on third and 17, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I'm like, this is really, this is the play call that we're working with here. And when he converted it, I was shocked and thrilled. But, you know, outside of that fumble, he had a really good game. And I was just listening to um, another Giants podcast, and they were saying that Gray when they went back and looked at the tape, that they all thought it was a touchdown. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it was, it's frustrating the way that that turned out, but what are your thoughts on Gray and how do you think he's going to fit into this rotation now with Singletary back? Yeah, first of all, I thought that was a touchdown too, but I just think we're it's ridiculous that we're in 2024 and we can't just have like, at least for the goal line situations, a chip in the football that says, did the ball cross the line or not? Like it shouldn't be like up to subjective eye tests based on, we don't even get a side dying angle there. It was like two bad angles. And then it's like, well, we went on the call on the field was one thing. So we're just going to kind of, you got to defer to ties the runner. We're talking about a 14 point swing. That's literally right. what that was. That's a game that should have been it you know, KO for the Giants. No team should really come back from a 14-point swing, which just shows how dominant the Giants were last week against the Seahawks. But to answer the important part of that question, I thought Gray looked good on tape, and I said this earlier this week, and I took some flack for it because you know what the replies are always going to be. No, he sucks. He fumbled. No, he sucks. He fumbled. He can't be on the field. And to be fair, he's fumbled a lot, and that yeah. is you can't stay on the field if you're going to fumble. That's obvious. But but they do it with Singletary. They do it with Singletary. You're right. <laughs> good point. Right. So he has stayed on the field through the fumbles, and – Gray has added to this offense in the screen game. He's their best option. And I think a lot of that was just, if you watched his tape at Oklahoma, he was really good in that phone booth of like finding space, low center of gravity, understanding angles and where to create that space. And then he did a really good job. What I actually, my favorite rep from him was that play in the red zone where he kind of went, ran a route and improvised, found the soft spot in the zone and gave Jones an option as Jones scrambled and broke the pocket to throw him the football. And he made the catch, got forward, set them up for that goal uh, red zone opportunity. So I think he can still be part of the offense, but with Tracy playing as well as he is, I, I, I quite frankly don't even want to give up any of those snaps. I want to get Tracy on the field for as many snaps as I can, because in my mind, Tracy is the second most important weapon in the Giants offense because of his versatility, because of what you can do with him. You can motion out into empty. You can bring him back. You can try to get him lined up one-on-one with a linebacker and run it and run something like a Texas route, which is something I would love to see them do. Just get him in. If they're playing man, get Tracy lined up against a linebacker because he is a former receiver. And he was, and obviously the stats weren't there because it's Iowa football, but like, that's not important. If you watch his tape, he could run routes. He can like, he's not the greatest receiver in the world, but he's probably one of the best receiving running backs in the entire NFL. 
Mm. I could say that just knowing that I watched a lot of tape of other running backs who start across the NFL and they're nowhere near the receiver that, that, that Tracy is. So I do believe it's important to keep him on the field. I like gray, but I would like to get Tracy more snaps. Yeah. I'm excited to see what they end up doing this Sunday. I think yep. it's going to be interesting. Um, let's talk about a little, a little bit about Jones and then we'll move over to the defense because obviously I think people have a lot of gripes with Jones, but I think the biggest consistent one is that he can never get past the first read. And I think from what I've seen from you and Nick on social and the way that I felt is, you know, I don't know how much in year six, you can change that. Is it different coaching? Is it the fact that the offensive line is proving well? Like there was a lot of question marks around that. Is that at this point in Jones's career, is that something that he's ever going to be able to improve upon? And after this game, I know I had seen that you say that you think this is the best Jones has ever done it. So can you, from what you've seen, attribute it to anything specifically or do you think that it's just he's comfortable in this offense and he you know finally has time with the offensive line and it's as simple as that so i'll start by saying this i think that um the game that he the, the performance he put on tape against seattle was one of if not his best performances on film when you adjust it to the opponent because you can talk about the minnesota game in the playoffs but just to be frank and honest about the situation, that Minnesota defense was in a horrific spot at the time of that game. They fired the defensive coordinator. And if you just go back and watch the tape, we did a review. There's just wild amounts of communication breakdowns and just open receivers on the running wide open. That's not the case against Seattle. Mike McDonald runs a good sound defense. So Jones mm -hmm. found solutions and beat them. I will say this. I think, you know, there's been more examples of him working through his progressions and reads, but still what a lot of this offense is, and, you know, the stats will show it, it's still mostly a first-read offense. Uh, Neighbors leads the NFL in first-read target percentage by a wild margin, um, and last week was, you know, Slayton in that role. And that's not a bad thing. What I think they've done, Dable and Jones, which is really important, is they've gotten much better at figuring out pre-to-post snap where the solution is going to be. And that mm -hmm. solution is their first read a lot of the time, most of the time. The vast majority of the time, that's fine. If you're figuring out the right solution pre to post snap and it's correct and you don't get beat by the post snap rotation by the safety or by the defensive coordinator being uh, understanding what you're trying to do and, and finding a solution to beat your solution, then that's great because that's why they've been so efficient as an offense. And until someone stops them from doing that, like Minnesota did on a consistent basis, there's no reason to go away from that. So I think the biggest difference for Jones for me is he's getting better at figuring out pre to post snap where that solution is going to be and being right about it with Brian Dable as well, working with him. But then there's also other improvements in his game. He's using his eyes so much better. So a lot of the time what you'll see is he'll move the stripe of his helmet toward one area of the field to hold mm -hmm. the safety or to hold the linebacker, and then he'll flip it back and he'll throw it to the other side of the field. And that's a really advanced level of, of quarterbacking that we've seen from him. His pocket feel is night and day from that Minnesota game yeah. last year. You can see him maneuvering in the pocket much better. So there's little areas of his game that are much better. As far as just working through full field progressions, they don't need to do that right now. It's not a big part of the offense. I mentioned earlier, they're 28th in the NFL throwing past the sticks. It's not as long as you find the solution pre to post snap, I'm okay with you not going through a full field regression to figure something out. But he has done that, by the way. There was a rep last week. Um, it ended up being a drop pass by Darius Slayton along the right hash. But Jones worked his way. They designed a deep shot down the middle of the field. It wasn't there. He worked his way back toward his second read, which was gonna, which was taken away by the linebacker. And he worked all the way back to the right side of the field to find Slayton. It was like a full field throw. Slayton just dropped it um, right by six. It would have been like a 10-yard gain, but it would have been a really good example of what you were talking about. Hmm. Another one of all of our concerns with Jones is, is the inconsistencies. So if Neighbors plays on Sunday, do you have any concern that, listen, we all want Neighbors to be a big part of this offense, but do you have any concern that it's going to go back to being a one-trick pony where it's just going to be Neighbors every time? Which again, is fine if it works, but I think one of the reasons why we had such good success about Seattle is we're finally utilizing all this talent that Jones has not had in the bulk of his tenure with the Giants. So I'm a little concerned. Again, obviously, I want neighbors to get the ball, but you've got Theo and Slayton and possibly Hyatt and Wandale and all of these other weapons that should be taken advantage of that. How do you think that they're going to balance that with him or Jones specifically balance that with him potentially coming back? It's a great question. I mean, last week we saw them get a lot more players more involved, uh, specifically Theo Johnson and specifically the running backs in the screen game. We've seen the running backs in the screen game be a part of the offense prior to last week. Just the, the Theo Johnson was kind of an addition to the offense um, involving him. 
Now, I'm personally not worried because I look back at last week's tape and then the tape from earlier this season, and I'm like, well, essentially, it was just kind of Slayton operating in the neighbor's roles, basically how it felt to me watching the tape last week. And you could see it from okay. the targets. And we still see Wandell operating what has become one of the most concentrated roles in the NFL. Wandell Robinson is third in the NFL in targets. That's all wild. wide receivers. It's an insane stat. Um, and his targets per route run is top seven, I believe, on a percentage basis. So this offense is still, like Nick and I have discussed, very concentrated. And that's fine mm -hmm. because... I personally don't like, I would love to get everybody involved, but I don't want to fix something that's not broken. And right now the giants offense is not broken for the first time in my memory in a long time yeah. for a four game stretch. Um, it hasn't been as good as last week. That was the peak of what it, what it can be. Um, for example, against Dallas, you mentioned how, look, we thought they were going to be able to run the ball and they weren't a lot of that was just scheme. Like Mike Zimmer sold out to stop the run. You can do that as a defensive coordinator. And it's why we saw four wide open deep shots because mm -hmm. if the defensive coordinator was selling out to stop the run. I don't think Lou Anarumo is going to do that. That's not really in his DNA. And I just don't see him as that kind of coordinator. So I think the run game will be important to get going as well. And that could open up stuff because that's a big reason why they were able to hit Theo Johnson last week. They used the play action and then Theo Johnson was open through that area where it would have vacated by maybe linebackers that would have been in coverage otherwise so you want to get Theo involved you want to get all these guys involved I think a big portion uh, re a big way to do that would be to get the run game going early I'm I'm excited for that I feel like for the first time in a while we finally seen a balanced offense so I hope that can continue mm -hmm. let's switch gears to the defense because their offense is also incredible with um obviously Chase and Higgins so Banks is coming off the best game so far this year. I I credit Henderson for uh, speaking out. He did what he had to do. And, you know, I think with this team, I I went into this season protect, projecting 10 wins because I'm insane. But I just felt like talent-wise, they're capable of doing it. It's And this is finally the team that I'm like, this is the team that I expected them to be. I just expected it to happen weeks earlier. But – now where they're at, um, I feel like they're all finally playing to their potential. And Banks is the Banks, you know, that we saw last year, whatever it took, whether it was Henderson or not. I think he's probably going to end up traveling with Chase is what it seems like. How do you feel about Flot and Adori? I think are probably going to be in the rotation against Higgins or vice versa. What's your biggest concern about their star wide receivers going against our corners? It's a major concern. I will say this, Cordell Flott, uh, that was Banks' best game, not only, at least on tape, not only this year, but in his career, I would say, without a doubt, last week. I would also say it's Cordell Flott's best game on tape within his career. Flott had some, Flott had one unbelievable PBU that was like a flash of what I saw at LSU. I was a fan, I was a big mm -hmm. fan of that pick. Not because I was like, oh, he's going to come right in and prove that pick right. It was like, he's 19 years old. I see the flashes of click and close on his tape. He's a long athlete who can cover ground in a re like really a lot of ground really quick amount of time when he's breaking down which you saw on that PBU last week in Seattle mm -hmm. we just need to see more of that when it comes to Cordell Fly and more consistency in his game I still think he's going to be struggling at times in different route combinations especially if he's asked to play one-on-one -on, -one on an island this is a difficult matchup for him it's a difficult matchup mm -hmm. for Adori the, I think the only way to really stop this passing game, if they're going to stop this passing game I think the Bengals are second in offensive VPA now uh, behind only Washington and if the, the only way to stop them is going to be to do what basically what happened last week, which is overwhelm their offensive line to such a large degree that the opposing team, Seattle in that case, and Cincinnati in this case, is forced to alter their game plan and use more quick game, use more mm -hmm. of the get rid of the ball in under two seconds. Because there were multiple times last week, and I haven't seen this in a while from a Giants defense, there were multiple times last week the Giants dropped seven in coverage, rushed four, and the pocket collapsed within one and a half seconds, two and a half, two seconds for Geno Smith. If you can do that, like you will mm -hmm. win almost every football game. And I kind of feel like that's the only recipe for success mm -hmm. against this Bengals team. Because if yeah. he has any time back there, Burrow, no offense yeah. to the Giants corners, but he's worked with these receivers for years, thousands of reps, and he's one of the best anticipatory throwers in the entire NFL, Burrow. That's what makes him him. His accuracy, people call it the word accuracy, but what it really is, and it is accuracy to an extent, what it really is is his mind. Like He's figuring out where the open space is going to be. He's putting the ball into that open space, and the receivers are running into it. He understands defenses really well. So I don't think Shane Bowen's going to fool him or anything like that. 
though I think mm. there will be some blitzes. But I think this game comes down to can the Giants win like they did last week? Losing Kayvon is tough, though. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. With that all being said, knowing that Aziz is probably going to take over those reps, um, Boogie Basham, I'm sure, will be involved a little bit. I'm curious to see if they elevate Toman Fox. Do you think that they make a big adjustment to the game plan knowing that Kayvon is out or not necessarily because Aziz isn't exactly a slouch, so he's had um, some success with the Giants. His biggest issue has been injuries. One thing I'm curious to see is they, they've been flipping the defensive ends a lot with Burns and Kayvon not playing one side, so one will be on the right, one will be on the left. I think this week we'll probably see Burns on the right side and, and Aziz on the left. Um why I'm so curious about it is because the best matchup for the Giants in this entire game is whoever lines up at left edge for the Giants versus the right tackle for the Bengals because mm -hmm. they're down to their third string right tackle right now um, due to injuries. Now, I assume the Bengals are going to provide him help throughout the entire game, if not yeah. every snap. Um, we'll see if that's the case, but there will be some one-on-one -on -one matchups, and that's going to be where the Giants have to cash in. So here's the thing. I think this will almost ultimately hurt the Giants more on like screen passes, draws, run plays than anything else. Cause that's where I think while Aziz has, you know, put some really good reps in the run game on film overall, he has not been a positive and net positive in the run game throughout his career with the giants. Mm -hmm. As far as pure pass rush reps go, like we're talking third and sevens, third and sixes, third and eights, those obvious passing downs. Aziz is going to probably offer more than Kayvon. I'm willing to say that as crazy as that may sound to some, and I don't want it to sound disrespectful. It's not. Yeah. Aziz is the best edge bender on this entire roster as far as just winning up the arc, bending around that edge of that tackle and getting to the quarterback when healthy. Mm -hmm. um, that includes Brian Burns, to be honest. And now Brian Burns is a much better pass rusher because he has other moves in his repertoire. Not that Aziz doesn't, but he's just a stronger player at the point of contact. Yeah. Uh, and, he's, and he's a little bit faster. But Aziz's edge bend is a weapon for the Giants. So if he can get those one-on-one -on -one matchups, I actually think Aziz is going to have a game that like if, we, if the Giants win this game, it's going to he'll be a big factor and people are going to be like, Oh my God, it's Ezo Jolari. What a game. Like now we know we have this in our bag too. And I do yeah. believe that he's healthy right now and he's looked good so far. Yeah. And I think a lot of people forget about him. I mean, yeah. he was one of our better edge rushers for a while until cave on and then burns. So injuries have hurt his career. Yeah, yeah. Big time. What do you think about Isaiah Simmons? Do you think he's going to get any rotation there too? Or you think it will be more yeah. boogie or Fox? It's interesting. There was some talk earlier, like throughout camp, if maybe he can be like an edge in this type of system, it's wide nine. So like you would think that maybe that fits him. I don't think the Gi that's been in the Giants plan at all. I, I almost get a feel like after the play he made it was so important, so monumental. It's like a coach almost was like, all right, I'll throw you a bone. And I'll give you 15, 20 snaps this week on defense. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that. It's a matter of where they're coming. So like with Isaiah, it's like he practiced as a nickel a lot in camp, which was always weird and never made sense. Yeah. But Drew Phillips is so good in that role, like when healthy, that you can't really take him off the field. Um, edge is not really something I foresee him. I almost like him if they were able to do it. The role that I saw last week, which is like from, from Okereke, it's not going to be a role for Simmons, but it's like interesting if you can find a way to use him sometimes on this role. Third and down situations like we were talking about before with disease, right? Third and passing down, obvious passing downs. What they did last week, which was really interesting, is they put the the inside linebacker, they put Okereke right up in the A-gaps. That means like right over the center. So he's pressing there before the snap. So now you're forcing this offensive line to make a decision on where they want to shift their pass production. He would mm -hmm. drop most of the time, uh, Okereke. But what it does is it's almost like a simulated pressure like we used to see with Wink Martindale, where the offensive line, again, is forced to commit, pick a spot, and it could lead to a one-on-one -on -one matchup. Last week, it led to plenty of one-on-one -on -one matchups with Dexter Lawrence against a guard, which is obviously a win for the Giants, and so yeah. on and so forth. So I kind of like to see Isaiah Simmons in that role almost because he's so fast. He can blitz from there, or he can drop in coverage, and he's not as aware uh, as a player like Bobby Okereke. He's not as understanding of where to be, but he's got athleticism. So I do think there should be something for him at some point in this defense. I don't know if it'll happen this week. We'll see. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I've been disappointed that I haven't seen him used as much on okay. defense, but I feel like the defense has been playing well enough that maybe, you know, they just feel like they don't necessarily need him. Right. Um, what did you see from Drew Phillips on tape this week? Because he was such an impact player before he dealt with that injury. And I, maybe it's just because, you know, of the way that I was watching the game, but 
I felt like I didn't see as much impactful play as maybe prior to this week. And maybe it was just coming off the injury. So what did you see? And then what are your expectations for him this week? Yeah. I mean, for Drew Phillips, for me, the, the value he adds to this defense is, is it's unquantifiable in the sense that his physicality around the line of scrimmage changes how a defense operates. So I'll, I talked earlier, for example, I talked earlier about flot great game in coverage last week. Two weeks before that was really bad as a run defender, I thought, and didn't show me much there. I don't think that's part of his game yet, but having that, like, and so my, I'm using this example to bring up, like, in the run game, they weren't really tested last week. They shut it down. Their corners didn't have to make a lot of plays. They could be tested in the run game this week or any of these weeks. Um, mm -hmm. The Bengals especially have a good outside, like, run scheme. That's where Drew Phillips, to me, is really going to make his mark as a rookie. He will have some plays in coverage for sure, and he's going to have hopefully some games where he can lock down a slot. But I like him as a physical player on this line of scrimmage, and I still saw that same physicality. I think he's going to just bring that every game. Him and Newbin, that's like two things I saw on their tape at college that got me really excited because mm -hmm. bringing that level of physicality from the DBs, I think is always an underrated part of any defense. All the great Giants defenses had it with Spags. Like you need to have these DBs who are not just willing tacklers, but good tacklers, quick to diagnose and physical. And that's yeah. what yeah. And we saw that from him. He was quickly becoming one of my favorite Giants players yep. because he is so physical. He's all over the field and his presence, I think, was really missed when he didn't play. Um, what was it? Week four. So I'm definitely excited that he's back. Um, all right. Let's talk special teams for a second. No update on Gunner, which I think is bizarre. Dable was asked about it, said he's not really ready. Um, Table doesn't give us anything when it comes to these injuries and everything we get is like Bella check in, like you're trying to like, you know, hide the code to the, to finding the treasure or whatever it may be. <laughs> like, it's just like crazy to watch. It's so bizarre. Did you listen to his press conference about yeah. Kayvon? Yeah. You're not getting anything. It was so bizarre. For those of you guys who didn't listen, he said that Kayvon had a wrist injury. And then someone follows up and says, you know, well, how long is he going to be out? And he's like, you know, he's going to be week to week. And they're like, you know, what happened? And it took multiple questions for Dable to finally be like, well, he had surgery. And then we find out later he had surgery. He got a screw put in. And he's going to be out four to six weeks. Uh, it, it's absurd. So yeah. who knows about Gunner? And no update about Gano either. Do you think that when Gano comes back, he's not getting the role? I no, mean, no, Greg no. has been, I'm very impressed with Joseph. Joseph's kicked well, especially after that first week where he had a rough start. But Gano, I think, will be the kicker once he's fully healthy. They've paid him so much money that that I feel mm. like they have to. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have an option because you're not going to carry two kickers on, on game day. I But you right. never know. I mean, if the injury is so bad, they could place him on injury reserve. But I think it's one of two things, either injury reserve or he's the kicker coming back. Um, mm. moving forward for the Giants. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what they do. I kind of feel like maybe Greg has earned his spot at this point. He's done mm. well. And Gano has an injury history at this point. So I'm curious to see, you know, what happens towards the True. end of the season. Um, I want to talk the, about the punt and kickoff returns because obviously we don't know now about Gunner, but I cannot stand to see Eric Gray back there. I'm losing my mind. Last week they brought up Turbo. I'm like, you signed Smith Marset. Glad that he's back there. But what are you doing putting Eric Gray back there? I don't, does it infuriate you as much as it does me? It's a fair criticism. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. It's, it's a fair criticism. We've seen the Giants have games ruined by punt returns plenty yes. of times in our lifetime, especially within also within this, you know, current regime with Brian Dable. Um, look, Gray's fumble history. This is actually, it's weird because Nick and I talked about this. Like when they drafted him, Gray, we were like, yeah, uh, well it's fifth round pick. So maybe he'll work. It was still Barkley was on the roster. Like we don't really know what his roles as a running back, but like, may, will he be a punt return? And then we looked into it and it was like, no, like the, he's fumbled as a punt returner there too at Oklahoma. So this is something that has been in his profile for a little while now. So I don't trust it either. For me, I always feel like with special teams, I'm I'm always the per person that's like, just fair catch it. Let me get out of here and just get my offense on the field. I There's so much more that can go wrong than than right when it comes to returning. Same thing for the kickoffs. So, I, so I'm just looking for sure hands there. Yes, I feel the same way. Well, then Tracy bobbled one of them. And, mm -hmm. you know, then the next thing, you know, we don't see Tracy out there again. And I'm like, why does Eric Gray get a hundred <laughs> chances to mess it up? Come and up. he's still out there. This Good is question. the stuff about Dable that drives me absolutely bonkers. Um, but I do feel like in the last couple weeks, I mean, weeks one through three, I was like, Dable's literally trying to get himself fired. And I didn't actually believe that because I don't think that he wants to get fired, but some of the decisions that he made 
I thought were absolutely insane. And I feel like, you know, the play calling is better and things are trying to get turned around. But what's your assessment of Dable at this point? I think a big th factor that like it's two sides for me with Brian Dable. There's three sides, let's say. We'll start with one importance. Uh, one of the they're all important. Let's start with one side of this. I think he's a really good motivator. And I think he's a really good has a good has a good. Um, what's the word for this? Has a good grasp of what the locker room is and what it should be and has. Mm. Let's simplify. Hold on. Let me simplify it like this. The players <laughs> like to play for him. And I really do yes. believe that. And that's mm -hmm. not the case. Always the players did not like to play for Joe judge at all. They didn't want to be a part of that. It brought a horrific atmosphere to the giants that never should have been here. I mean, uh, it still frustrates, frustrates, sorry, frustrates me to this day. Like yeah. I was never on team. Let's run the laps around the parking lot and let's, and it's fun to do that, whatever. But like, like this is good to run the laps. Like this is a good thing that we're bringing this kind of thing. in. that was never going to work in the NFL. It had no chance of working. The only way that will work is if you have Tom Brady as your quarterback. So your coach can basically tell you to do whatever you want because we're going to win Super Bowls every year. Can't mm -hmm. bring that in. So I like the feel he brings. The second part of Dable is what he does as an offensive designer and how he gets these quarterbacks to play their best football. Four different, I'll say four different. It's two, three different quarterbacks, two different versions of one quarterback, that being Daniel Jones. Got the most I could imagine out of Tommy DeVito. Mm -hmm. Got an incredible amount out of Tyrod Taylor that a lot of Giants fans underrate, but Tyrod Taylor was eighth best uh, EPA in the NFL in clean pockets last year. Wow. He filtered out all the plays where there was jailbreak pressures, which affected all the quarterbacks. He was really good last year and number one in explosive pass rate. Um, Jones, 2022. Got so much out of him, changed who he was as a quarterback. Now we're seeing an even better version of Jones this year that he's gotten out of him. They're seeing the offense together so much better. These screen calls are unbelievable. Every time the team is blitzing or sending guys in, he's beating them with screens or he's finding solutions. So many routes I see where he's creating these natural free pick plays, essentially, that won't be called by the refs because technically they're not a pick play, though they are, but they can't be called that way and they won't be flagged. And that's why we're getting neighbors with space. That's why we're getting all these receivers, Wandell, with space. So the play designer version of Dable. I like that too. Now the in-game manager, the in-game coach, that's where I've always struggled with Dable. Um, yeah. It's weird because he was really aggressive his first season at the beginning of the season. Yeah. And then he's kind of changed and he's become a different kind of coach who, um, you know, doesn't want to go for it in that fourth down situation or isn't managing his timeouts maybe the best he could by the end of half or the clock. So these are all areas that I think he is a little bit lacking in. But for me, the way I look at this, and it's, it's very interesting, but in my mind, at least, I think that like if you just fire a coach, a lot of fans want to fire a coach, fire a GM. Yeah. The other side of this thing, the grass is not always greener. More times mm -hmm. than not, it's not. There's not a lot. It's the NFL is not flooded with great head coach candidates every single year. And more yes. importantly, like we could get back to a point like we've been in the past with Judge and mm -hmm. with McAdoo and even with some of the other coaches where the offense is dead again and you can't watch Giants football. Like we forget, yeah. like we've had a lot of years where we're like 30 two to 31st and, and we're just punting, punting, punting every single possession. And the offense line is breaking down. We've gotten us to a point where we can move the football. And I like that. And I think a lot of that has to do with Brian Dable. So I don't want to lose that just yet. Um, I want to give yeah. him some time for sure. That's how I felt. And I think the biggest reason why fans were feeling like that is because Bill Belichick is out there. Because whenever I, I hear it from people, I'm like, well, who do you want to be the head coach? And it's all Belichick. It's never anyone else who's a head coach. Occasionally, Vrabel is thrown in there. But I think if Belichick wasn't out there, the noise would be a little bit quieter. And listen, I, I was really upset about the Minnesota game because I just felt like the team was wildly unprepared. And yeah. it's like no one had any idea what they were doing out there. But now as the weeks go on and our team has improved and Minnesota is 5-0, and start to look at it a little differently and say, OK, maybe Minnesota is just that much better. And, you know, the Giants also had a bad day. But I think it was a mix of those two things. But I feel yeah. like... Dable has has really improved over the last couple weeks. And what I've seen, I have been happy with. And I agree with you. I don't think that bringing in a new coach or a GM is going to solve all of our problems. And when you look at the way the season is going with all of these rookies and, you know, Bobby O'Karake and John Runyon and Illuminor, like, I just don't know how you could look at it and say, Joe Shane needs to be fired. Like if Dave Gettleman got four years, then Joe Shane deserves at least four years. So you're, I just try to say like the reality is you're never going to hit on all of your draft picks.
So um, I, there was something else. Oh, I heard you and Nick talk about the fact that you think when we talked about Dable's aggressiveness, because I felt the same way that I don't understand why all of a sudden he plays it's safe seemingly all of the time as opposed to being a little bit aggressive. You said that you feel like he's playing more often not to lose than to win. So can you talk about what you've seen from that? And do you think, you know, what does Dable need to do to change that? Because I think it's it's really hard to watch that as a fan. It's every week for years and years of the game going down to the wire and the team can't close out games. And then all of a sudden, the defense decides with five minutes left in the fourth quarter that they're going to play it soft. And it drives me insane. Yeah, I mean, just to the, I'm going to talk about your your question, but at first point, it's like, the tape is so crazy because you watch the tape and you learn so much because you're watching just play, 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 play and like one side of the ball. And like the Giants defense last week really didn't get moved on with the exception of when they went to the two minute drill before the yes. half Seattle. And then at the end of the game, those last couple of possessions and on all three of those possessions, the Giants altered what they did schematically on defense completely. Right. So they played more off coverage. They're playing further off the ball, a version of prevent defense, not prevent defense, but like a version of that style, softer coverage. So it's like, as a coach, it's like, but at the same time, I'm like, well, if I'm Shane Bowen and I'm Brian Dable, I'm like, well, there's a clock factor here. So I can give up a 13 yard reception here because it's going to move the clock. And mm -hmm. we're playing not just them now. We're not playing just the offense now. We're playing the clock now. And that's how Brian Dable is on the offensive side of the ball to your main question a lot of the time, right? I'm playing the clock, not just playing, can I beat this defense? And I think that just is who he is as a coach. I don't necessarily like, I don't like this. You don't love this. And, and I think as a fan, it's, you always want them to be aggressive and try to win the game, not play to lose. Mm -hmm. But I have to also admit just from like watching enough football. And I think you can probably agree with this, that like, this is not uncommon. Andy Reid does this. McVay does this a lot of like the winning Shanahan. A lot of the coaches have won. A lot of games have done this too. I just think it's part of the nature of football. Like some coaches mm -hmm. are playing, have a different mindset of what they want to do at the end of games. They don't want to make a mistake by trying to open the offense up and they want to play the clock. They want to bleed the clock out. And it works sometimes. It worked last week. Like it works probably more than we think is kind of my main takeaway mm. from this. It's frustrating as a fan. You always want them to try to play to win. Like I didn't love what happened at the end of that game. And even if you take it back like a couple weeks ago, right against the Browns, the Giants offense was phenomenal in the first yep. half. They took the air out of the ball in the second half. Now, part of that was adjustments from the Browns. But part of that was just the Giants were playing the clock too and playing the idea of like, and Nick always talks about this. A lot of this is situational too, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're Brian Dable and you see how bad of a game I'm taking it two weeks ago, Deshaun Watson is having, right? And that Browns offense is having. Why would you take the risk of throwing an interception or having your quarterback get sacked and fumble on a longer right. drop back pass when you know that that quarterback can't beat you or hasn't beaten you yet? So I think it's situational too. So it's frustrating. I want them to play to win and try to like continue to not, you know, have to worry about that. But it is what it is sometimes. We'll see. Hopefully there will be moments where we're like, yes, stable. You went for it and it worked. <laughs> Yeah. And I just want to feel like, you know, maybe I'm not having heart palpitations for the last two minutes of every single game, every single week. Like, Yeah. A nice I blowout win would be great, especially because last week they did blow out the Seahawks yes. in every other factor, but the scoreboard, which is yes. why I think it's frustrating. Yes, exactly. And I, it's funny, I get these DMs from other fans and they're like, you know, taking my heart medication to, <laughs> at the end of the game, yeah. like the side effects. It's just, it's funny. Like, you know, we're all kind of just going through the same thing. All right. So with all of that being said, um, let's end it on this. What do you, what is your prediction for Sunday? So I want to preface this by saying I have gotten all one week, Nick and I didn't do a preview, but all other weeks we did a preview and I've gotten all four of them wrong. So okay. this, is, this is two years ago, by the way, I got cold taked for calling the Giants a nine win team back before 2022. Everyone's like, this oh, is wow. the stupidest prediction ever. And I got that right. So not okay. always wrong. I've had a couple hits, but this year I've been way off on this team. So I just want to preface that. Um, yeah. With that said, they played such good football last week. Mm -hmm. I like the matchup on the offensive side of the ball. I don't love it on the defense side of the ball, but I think there's going to be enough times where the Giants defensive line overwhelms the Seahawks. I'm sorry, the, the Bengals offensive line. Obviously, Daniel Jones is what? One in 13 or one in 14 in prime time. Yeah. One of those two. I think it's, it's 14. pretty bad. <laughs> not great, Bob. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, yikes, not great, Bob. But yeah, this feels like maybe he can take that step forward. I hope in this game, this is such a defining game for Giants season 
mm-hmm. for Daniel Jones, right? Like this idea that like Jones has taken this step forward, right? Well, we still need to see it. He had a great yes. game against Seattle. We still need to see something like this, like primetime game against a bang- hungry Bengals team that's playing for their season. Because if they lose, they're basically officially done at one and five. It's very hard to come back from. Mm-hmm. Can Jones overcome this, right? We thought the same thing with Dallas. Can Jones overcome that, beat the division rival? Like it didn't happen that week. Now it has to happen. And I think yeah. he will. I really do feel confident or maybe overly confident. Some might say I'm okay with that. Um, I think this is a better matchup than the Dallas was for, for the reasons that I've stated. So I'm going to go with, let's do, we're going to, we're going to get to 30 for the first time in a while. Let's do 30 to 28 giants last minute field goal for the giants down 28, 27 to win. Okay. I I had almost the exact same prediction on a podcast last night. So I'm going to stick with it because I think the same way. I think it's going to be a little bit more high scoring because I just don't think that the defense is going to be able to completely shut down Chase and Higgins. I think they could do enough to have it not be a 40 point game. Um, but I just don't think that they can get them to that. So I said 31, either 27, 28 with a last minute field goal from Joseph. And I, I feel like for the first time going into Seattle, I was like, God bless this team where we're, if we score seven points, I'll be happy. But I feel like, you know, they are consistently getting better every week. The biggest problem that I have with them is the last two minutes and whether or not they can close it out. So I just hope that this is a week where they say we did it last week on all three sides of the ball. We played complimentary football and we're building off of that. And, you know, everyone is, is playing better, but I feel like for Jones too, like this is, this is the opportunity. You're coming off the best game of your giants career last week. You've got to have some confidence back, especially if neighbors is in got to feel like you know you can go out there and wing the ball around and have success i'm with you on that it's it's obviously this is the moment for him i think to change a lot of the narratives that are surrounded him and and put the giants in position at three and three if they could win this game where they're in 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 a much better spot than we ever could have expected because look at one and three it looked bleak yeah everything kind of changed not just because they beat it's not like they just beat the like if they just beat the seahawks and some weird fluky stuff happened a pick six or you know a punt return touchdown a punt block touchdown like and they won like 20 to 17 it's a different story but they look dominant on all three sides of the ball on tape that was the really for me the eye-opening moment because i don't remember the last time the giants have looked that dominant on tape in the dable era since the colts game is definitely mm. the, the most recent time which i barely count because it's against a dead coach who was getting fired that season and they were playing horrible football with like yeah. um nick Foles, i think was starting that game and then they went to the the other dude uh, uh forget forget his name but like the seahawks were a real team they were three and one at home mm-hmm. that's a yeah. you know dominating team like that is gives me some real hope so i hope it happens we'll see what happens i, I don't want to ever get my hopes up too much as a giants fan because it's just been so bad for so long um but I'm going to be there. I know you're going to be there. So I'm excited about going to the game. It's my first one I get to go to. And so hopefully they can deliver for us. At the very least, the tailgate is fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got that going for you no matter what. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for having or for joining me. Um, tell everyone where they can find you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. And I always love talking ball with you. So it's a good time. Um, you can find our work for Big Blue Banter is the name of the podcast. And you can find my work actually on Twitter at Dan Schneier NFL. Um, but the podcast you can find on iTunes, Spotify, just type in Big Blue Banter. And then YouTube, that's where we're really trying to grow. So if you want to help us grow the show, check out our YouTube page. It's just Big Blue Banter into your YouTube search bar. Please subscribe. Please like. That's how you help us grow. Um, that's where you're going to find the film review. So what you're going to get there is offensive film review, defensive film review every week. And there's a lot of tape we put up there. So we have tape that we break down and we cut up and then we break down the plays on tape. So I think that's probably the most valuable resource we have from the show. So give that a look. Thank you. Yeah. And I love to watch it on YouTube because I think it's so helpful to see the breakdown, you know, as fans to a lot of the time during the game, you're just, you're so focused on every play and then it's on to the next that unless you sit down and review the film and you can kind of answer some of the questions like about Hyatt and things like that. So it's a great resource guys, make sure you check it out and then make sure you subscribe here, everything New York giants on all podcast platforms on YouTube too. Let's go giants. See if they can bring home another win.